Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Renee Gadaly and Steve Goldberg. So if you've been members of the club for any period of time, you've probably run across uh, both Renee and Steve's names quite frequently. Both have served as presidents of the Houston Astronomical Society, Renee more recently than Steve, but uh, are both indispensable members of the Houston Astronomical Society. Um, they both have participated in a leadership <laughs> role at the uh, Texas Star Party as well. And for those of you who've, heard, who've not heard about the Texas Star Party, it's perhaps the largest, most popular star party for the folks who live in the Texas area and some of the surrounding states. So if you never had the opportunity to go, highly recommend you, uh, you pencil it in, you know, try to get in maybe to the next one, but it's a wonderful event under dark skies with hundreds of other amateur astronomers and it's just a, an absolute blast to join. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce and pass the mic over to Renee and Steve. Um, Steve, Renee. <laughs> Steve's here. Go ahead, Steve. Me first? Yes, you first. Oh, me first. Okay. Uh, let's share this guy here. And for those of you who may have questions for Steve or Renee uh, afterwards, please type those questions in the chat function here and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. So we're going to talk about the Texas Star Party. Um, it's also uh, known as TSP. And let me get my presentation here going. So we're going to talk about what it is. And we talk about that it's also known as Summer Camp for Adults. Where is it? The different observing fields, different TSP events, the skies over TSP. And we're going to talk about the purpose of it. It's for the observer. There's other star parties around the country. Some of them are designed for ATM telescope makers. Uh, there's one that's more for vendors. And this came out, started in 1982 uh, at the Prude Ranch and it was designed for the observer. It's a whole week long. So with that, we also stay at the ranch, the Prude Ranch in Fort Davis. And we call it blackout because we're the only ones on the ranch. So we can turn out all the white lights any of the hotel rooms that are facing the observing field, we put foil on the windows so any white light doesn't accidentally go out onto the field. We have light restrictions at night, therefore no driving at night. Of course, if it's cloudy, you know, no telling what will happen. We have no morning activities because we assume, assume you've been staying up all night. So the first activity during the day really is lunch. So where is it? Well, you are here. And it is here. Go out I-10 for about 10 hours and hang a left. Uh, or it's about 140 songs on an iPad. So that's where it is. So we stay at a place called the Prude Ranch. It's a Western style type ranch. It's a summer camp. Uh, other organizations will go out there for you know several days for some type of convention or get together. We've had bicycles, motorcycle conventions out there. It's dusty. It's rustic, it's dry, and it's dusty. The dining hall and meeting hall are there on the ranch. So you don't have to really uh, drive anywhere. You can just drive on and then drive off when you're ready to leave. Everything is a walking distance on the ranch. So all the hotel rooms, um, bunk houses, observing fields, they're all there on the ranch. There's a swimming pool, daytime only, because you can't swim at night because you have to have, you know, the state says you have to have lights on at night, and we don't want that. There's horseback riding if you want. And did I say it was dusty there? Here's a map of the ranch. Starting the lower right is the main gate. And as you drive in, there's a bunch of RV slots here, about 40 RV slots. This is the lower observing field. A very important room right here is the dining hall, an auditorium where the meetings are held. Uh, here's a bunch of the bunk houses, all in this area here. This is the central field, and up here is the upper field. These are the motel rooms that we'll, we'll mention in a few minutes. These blue lines, as we put out power lines, and we just have them labeled, so you can mark you know, where you are, and they typically have a program that you can put in and say where I am, so if somebody wants to look you up, they know where, where to find you just by the uh, power connection cord. This is the front gate uh, of the ranch. 
Uh, to the right is Fort Davis, about five miles. To the left is McDonald Observatory, about 12 miles. So we're actually between the two. Here's an upper observing field before the place opens, before the people get there. These people that are set up are typically the volunteers. They'll set up first you know, before everybody comes on uh, so they can get their spot and then they can do their volunteering uh, during TSP. And then once uh, the gates are open, this is what it'll look like. And the fields are set up. So there's only telescopes in the middle with all the cars and trailers around the outside and the tents. So, you know, we maximize the space in the middle of the field for the telescopes. There's a central observing field. Here again, there's a space for the telescopes in the middle and tents and RVs or vehicles around the perimeter. Whereas the lower observing field is somewhat freeform. We do put out power cords there, but you know, you'll see trailers and you'll see tents, and you'll see telescopes. So those will all be there. One of the different TSP events that we have there, we have astrophoto or imaging contest. So if you take pictures and images, they try and uh, have a contest on winners and there's a people's choice award for that. Uh, there's ATM amateur telescope making recognition. So people who make things, whether it be a telescope, eyepiece box, observing stool, something related to astronomy, we have a recognition for that. There's an art contest. So if you do a lot of art or some medium that's uh, taken in, they have different observing programs, novice, binocular, a telescope in advance. The novice is designed for the non-astronomer. We're trying to bring them in. Like if spouses or partners come that are not into astronomy, we give them this. And it's like, find this constellation. It's like 10 objects. You know, if some of the planets are up, find the planet. You know, not looking for any 12th magnitude cluster or anything like that. There are two main awards, a lone stargazer and Omega Centauri. Lone stargazer is given to a person or, or a group that has done something specific that they enjoy doing, as opposed to Omega Centauri is something you've done to promote astronomy. We have a great big uh, Texas giveaway, a lot of door prizes. We do that on two nights. And sometimes on cloudy nights, they'll have a movie, uh, some groups will get together and just have some fun out in the field. But as soon as the sky is clear, those night activities stop and they go back to observing. So there are different housing types there. There are motel rooms, family cabins. Motel rooms is typically uh, two beds uh, and they have two queen beds. Uh, a family cabin is a queen bed and two sets of bunks. So if a group or family wants to go in there, you know, it's got two or three kids, you know, that's one place that they can go. We have a bunkhouse and we're from like four to seven people in a bunkhouse. We have RV slots. We have about 50 RV slots there with electricity, water, and dump. Or tent camping, you know, dry tent camping. There's places there. You just When you get there, you just find a place you can put your tent and set up. Or you stay off site. So these are all the different types of housing. So skies over TSP. Let's look at a movie here. No, hear music. We do. You can see all the activity on the bottom of people walking around with all their red flashlights little clouds on the horizon, and then
So those are the skies over TSP. Any questions? That's it. A little introduction to tell you what's there. Yeah, uh, Steve, we did have one question from Chris. He said, can we stay in a hotel outside and come and leave during light hours? I guess he's maybe talking about during the night, nighttime. Or, uh, Chris, yeah. if you want to come off of mute and clarify that, please feel free to do so. Yes, you can stay in. I said there was off-site. What you do is you can park outside of the gate. And it didn't say on, on the map, but from the front gate to the upper field, it's total about a half a mile. So it's not that far of a walk, of a walk uh, to get back out to the front gate. So yes, you, you set up your scope. For everybody, you set up your scope, you just leave it for the whole time period. And if you are staying off site, you know, whenever you want to leave, just walk to the front gate, out the gate, get in your car and go back into town to your hotel. If you stay outside in the hotel, where do you park your car? Outside, the, 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 at night time, you park it outside the gate. Okay. Let me see if I can go back. So you would park your car down here. There's okay. a wide enough spot off the road, so you're not in the road. You know, just right here is where you'd go. And you can set up your scope, you know, on any one of these fields. And it, when at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock or two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, you want to leave, just walk out to the front gate okay. and get in your car and go. And you park it so your headlights are not toward the ranch, but head out to the, to the, uh, to the, ro uh, to the road. Is there really enough space to park the car? There are a lot of cars parked outside. No, there's not that many because most people are stayed inside. I see. Okay. And people who are staying on the ranch have their cars on the ranch, not outside. All right. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Uh, and then we'll go to Renee now and uh, listen to her presentation about the Texas Star Party. And again, if you have any questions, go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll get to those at the end of the uh, presentation as well. Okay, so yes, thank you, Steve. And now everybody wants to get to TSP and uh, you got to sign up to go. And uh, maybe you've seen this uh, website before. And if you haven't, that's how you get to it. That's where uh, things almost always begin. Uh, to attend, we've got um, basically just three steps. Um, you apply and you, oh, I, gotta, I can't read my. Screen, let me put this down or move it. Uh, you enter the TSP drawing and you register and pay. And that's basically it. Um, here are some details about each of those uh, steps. Um, the application process. Um, if you have ever attended a TSP before, you will receive an email invitation to apply. Um, if you have not attended before, you won't miss out because as soon as somebody gets an email, they will let everyone know on the website, on the Facebook group, uh, on Discord, you, you will not, on the Astro list, you'll find out about it and uh, you'll go over here and you need to log in. Now, if you've never... Um, created an account on this website, you hit the login button just like everybody else and you are presented with a form to create your account. So no worries there. And once you do that, the application form is, or the application page uh, with the forms you need to download and complete is activated and you'll see that. Um, the forms ask questions um, like, the number of days you're attending, if you're going to purchase a meal plan, if that's an option, it is for tent campers and RV people and such. Um, and uh, you'll need to, when you make all your selections, you need to get the signatures of all the adults. And really important here is to select your housing choices. And Steve just talked about 
all of those. And you, what you select are your top three uh, preferred choices. Um, and that will become, you know, you could end up uh, choosing the same housing choice, but that, that'll bite you later on, as we'll see. Um, then the last step for applying is to upload your completely filled out scan documents. Then the TSP drawing. Everybody gets a chance to attend. And the way uh, we do that is um, housing reviews the applications as they come in and uh, they that team either accepts your application or returns it because you have missing information. So try to get it as complete as possible, but you'll get an email if you're missing some info. And a lot of times it's just a matter of all the adults haven't signed the document. And then here's the real drawing part. At some date, as a line in the sand, um, TSB operations and actually Carl Baltz will assign uh, a random sequence number to each of the applications. Um, he uses, uh, I don't know which one, but he uses a random uh, number generator and everybody gets the uh, same chance to um, be number one in line. Um, now, once you have been assigned a, a number, the housing team um, starts filling in your requests for housing, uh, going by the sequence number first, and then by the availability of your choices. So if you're sequence number one, you probably are going to get your first choice. If you're sequence number 400, I don't know. Um, but if you do get your um, uh first choice or any choice, housing will email you an offer. And if you don't get your first choice, you are also allowed to uh, request being on uh, the wait list. Um, but there is a problem with being on the wait list. Um, and it, this is a little bit different to understand here because um, as the housing team is sifting through these uh, requests, um, if you choose a motel room, say, for all three of your choices, and you have a large sequence number, you run into the real chance of being waitlisted. Um, and that is because if you're number 100, for instance, and all the motel rooms have been filled, but someone in during this process cancels and a motel room gets freed up, the person, say application number 400, who has also requested a motel room could take that spot before you. And that's because all applicants get a first shot at housing in sequence order. And once everybody's gone through, then housing starts filling in the other uh, openings. And then once that's done, you register and pay. And um, basically, you uh, there's two parts to this. And basically, you pay a TSP registration fee online by PayPal. And the registration fee is like, well, any conference you would pay a registration fee to attend. And uh, I believe we were able to also purchase T-shirts online by PayPal at the same time. And once you do that, TSP emails that you have, your registration is complete. And so you've gotten your golden ticket and you can attend, uh, you know. But if you're not quite done because you need housing, and if you're staying at the Prude, you'll need to send them your deposit. Um, and uh, actually the email that you're sent will remind you about that. If you're staying off site or somewhere else, of course you'll deal with uh, them directly. Now, uh, this last uh, TSP, we did um, uh, some other events in the morning. Um, generally speaking, most of us do sleep through the morning hours, but there were quite a few uh, 
uh, bird walks and nature events and um, and such. And I took I snagged these photos from uh, the Texas Star Party um, uh, Facebook um, uh, group. And um, I like to think of amateur astronomers as night sky naturalists. But, you know, all of us are pretty well-rounded and um, a lot of us are also daytime naturalists. And these uh, photos, I'm just, you know, I'm just, uh, let, me, let me call out to some of the people. I'm gonna have to read these because these are beautiful pictures. Um, let's see, I snagged that uh, photo of the um, goats, bottom right, in front of one of the motel rooms that was taken by Doug McCormick. Um, the um, red capped, oh, I'm forgetting its name. The bird in the middle there uh, was snagged by an uh, Razi As Asaduddin, and sorry if I butchered that name. Um, the beautiful on the left, Okotia in bloom, and on the opposite kitty corner to the right, the uh, cactus that was taken by Terry Van. And um, the top left, I took that one outside um, the mo my motel room uh, from the deck. It, it is just gorgeous there. And, um, you know, astronomy kind of caters to the, um, the introvert and it's often a solo um, activity. But you'd never know it when you get to TSP. And um, here are some friends here. I mean, if you look at the top left there, that's uh, Jenny Stein. And she's got all her charts and books and notes and everything out, just ready to observe uh, during the night. Bottom left, that's um, Carl Baltz. Uh, he is um, the president. Uh, top right, you might recognize quite a number of people uh, from HAS, uh, they are working the point of sale desk. Um, the bottom right is a grouping of some uh, serious girl power. Uh, and in the middle is a selfie that uh, uh, Suzette McNeil took of uh, herself and me. And it looks like that was before coffee. But if you can see in the background, um, that is a picture of the ham shack guys. And I have never seen the ham shack or met the guys before. And I was kind of, you know, I don't know about those guys, um, but I met them and I, I got to tell you, they're okay. So um, swing by and say hi. And um, that that is it for this little um, uh, land yap of TSP. And um, I guess we have uh, time for a couple of questions and I'll answer them and they'll probably, they'll probably be the only questions I can answer tonight. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you scare me, Joe. Yeah. So I'll ask a question and I think you got to it. Um, so I don't know if, if you had any additional clarification you needed, but the question was, is it first come first serve to be full or is there a lottery? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Renee answered my question. So, okay. yeah, thank oh, you. Okay, great. I mean, I, I guess any any statistics on um, how many apply and what capacity is out there generally? Well, you know, last year we were really ramping up from the COVID business and we still had to be really careful. But there was only one person that ended up staying on the wait list um, list who did not get an assigned spot. And basically from what I could tell was um, he just decided the last minute not to come, but um, motel rooms are gonna fill up first. Um, and then the bunk houses are great. I mean, you know, and then uh, if you're gonna stay in a tent, you know, you can be there. And then of course, um, if you're staying off site, uh, you you can also get out there, but we can handle quite a few people. Um, Steve, do you want to um, talk about you know maybe the most the, the time we had the most people out there? I was just waiting for you to take a breath so I can come in here. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this, this past year, we had, I think, 310 people come in. Um, and in recent years, we've been pushing four to 500. In 1994, there was an annular eclipse nearby, and we had 900 <laughs> people on the ranch. So, wow. yeah. You know, so typically, we were running, you know, 500 people that can come through on the ranch total, you know, attendees, that some of those are off-site and a majority are on-site. Does that answer your question, Saul? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I believe Chris had a few questions. He was uh, chatting with me privately on, and I chatted, I sent those back to you, Chris. Uh, hopefully those asked, answered your questions, but uh, he had asked what the uh, website was, and then you can see there, if I'm sharing the screen properly, uh, TexasStarParty.org is the website to get to uh, the Texas Star Party website. And Joe, yes, um, pull down the how to attend up at the top. Oh, so, how to attend? Yeah, how to attend. That the the uh, that maybe it's on. Go look on. Go to the left one time. The the news. There's a place they have a bunch of videos. Uh, the third one, uh, third one down, new videos. The orientation. Uh, left, left. No. 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 Oh, well, maybe there's some there too. No, it's news. The third one down was new videos. Oh, okay. Yeah. And there's a bunch of different videos there that have been taken over the years. So I'll give you a, a flavor for it. When do you have it? Which which month? Um, it's going to be the end of May this year. Uh, let's see. There, uh, right there, uh, May 14th, that week. How is the weather there at that time? Is it hot? We've had seven clear nights. We've had one time there was uh, 40 minutes of clear the whole week. Oh, so, dear. <laughs> so it, it, it's, a, it's a shoot, you know. Um, it, yes, it can be hot. If you stay in the tent, uh, yeah, it's going to be hot there. Um, if you're on, on site housing, you know, it's not as bad. But you're in the high desert, so it typically it's cold at night. I, I don't think yeah. I've ever been out to observe without having to wear multiple layers. Yeah. Um, one in, in the meeting hall, they have, they don't have air conditioners, they have coolers. Um, and what it is, is just, uh, a fan blowing with hay and water sprayed on it. And I was complaining one time that the they weren't cooling enough. And they said, well, what do you expect? The humidity is up to 10%. <laughs> <laughs> so so it, it is dry. We're at 5,000 feet. And it's dusty. I was going to say, and it's dusty. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Does anybody else have any questions for uh, Steve or Renee? All right. Thank you so much for sharing that information, Steve, Renee. Uh, like I said, for those of you who've never been to the Texas Star Party, there's nothing else quite like it. I hope you have the opportunity to uh, apply and, and join us out there next year. I think it's just absolutely fantastic. And uh, just one more thing is that we've met people here we see once a year and we just renew friendships, you know, every time we go. Uh, and sometimes we've gone to some other star parties. We'll see them there, too. So absolutely. And this is uh, a picture that I took with my iPhone at the uh, upper field of the Texas Star Party this past year. So 30 second exposure That's crazy. my iPhone, my telescope there in the foreground, and you see the Milky Way there in the background. So, um, you know, this is obviously a little bit of an exaggeration of what you see with the Milky Way there, but it is bright. I mean, if you saw Steve's video as the Milky Way was rising, you saw a definite brightening there uh, on the left hand side as it was rising over the horizon. So. There's reports that first timers at TSP think that's a rain cloud coming up and they start packing up. It's really the Milky Way. Yeah. And the first time I made it to the Texas Star Party several years back, I uh, got there at night. So I parked in the front uh, parking lot. Uh, you know, obviously couldn't bring my vehicle up to the field. And I trudged my way up the half mile to the upper field. I was looking for Steve and Amelia. And uh, I got there and I kind of embarrassed embarrassed about this and but uh, at the time when I asked Amelia I said Amelia I can't seem to find the Big Dipper can you point me in the right direction I mean there are just so many stars out there that even bright constellations or asterisms are hard to make out 
Uh, it's just uh, I always start with binoculars. Yeah. First night binoculars. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, uh, again, if you have any questions that you can think of as we go through the rest of the program, go ahead and use the chat function and uh, we'll get to those at the end. But for now, we are going to start our trivia time. So for those of you who are uh, wanting to play, like I said, we've got a, a grand prize of a $50 uh, Amazon gift card. Second place is a $25 gift card and third place is a $15 gift card. So have your smartphones ready. And if you're not on a smartphone, use the uh, computer that you have right now and you can join us. You go to www.menti.com. You see that there at the top and use the code 77008191, 77008191. Let me go ahead and copy this and paste it into the chat. Bear with me one second. For those of you who wanna play along on your laptop, you can just click on this link and that should take you there. The thing I will ask you to do though, if when you join, it wants to assign you some random cheesy name. Don't use that name. We want to know who you are so we can uh, award the prizes to the people who win them. So um, here are the rules, okay? So as I mentioned earlier, log in with your real name. Don't use the nickname that it provides you. Uh, that's what's going to happen if you just click on join quiz. So take the time to change your name there. Uh, each question, you have 20 seconds to answer. So the faster you answer those questions, the more points you get. So if you answer... Uh, you know, this first question with once, you know, just taking one second to answer it, you're going to get a lot more points than if you had taken 19 seconds to answer it. So it is progressive in that regards. You are going to get more points for the, the uh, speed in which you answer the question, but you do have to answer it correctly. Uh, you don't get any points for providing incorrect answers. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, a $50 Amazon gift card for first place, 25 for second place, and a third place gets $15 uh as part of the amazon gift card so again if you haven't had the chance to join yet you can go to menti.com uh use that code 77008191 if you have a smartphone you can just pull out the camera app take a snapshot of that qr code and it'll take you straight there or if you want to play on the laptop uh, use that code on the left or use the the uh, the link that i sent in the chat function itself so i'll give everybody a minute or two to do that and uh, hopefully we'll get quite a few people. If this is the first time you're, you're doing one of these quizzes, um, these trivia contests, you've never done a Don Sully trivia contest, I guarantee you you're going to be frustrated. Don't worry about it if you think, hey, I'm not answering these correctly. I've, I've only gotten a handful of them. Uh, I think we've gone through many of these and the lead changes so much over the course of the trivia contest. And uh, it's usually one on the last question. So, uh, you know, give it a shot. I think this is a lot of fun. And if you have any issues with the questions, those go directly to Don Selly and not to me. So hopefully everybody's had an opportunity to, to jump in. Um, would, would a few of you mind just uh, coming off of mute? Let me know if you, if you were able to get in okay. And uh, Goldberg's got in on the cell phone. I'm in. Okay, perfect. Uh, I, uh, has it started? Okay. All right, we're getting ready to start. I'll start to see people jumping in. Again, I'll give folks another minute or so. So menti.com. Okay, I see it now. 8191. Go ahead and take a look at your, your phone or your laptop to make sure you're there. I'm seeing that number that you see on the bottom right-hand corner, three. That's the number of people who are in right now. So not everybody's in. So Joe, I think I'm in, but I didn't see an opportunity to put my name in. Um, yeah. I'm not I sure. didn't either. I didn't no? yeah. see it either. Okay. So what we'll do at the end then, if, if that's the case, if it assigned a random name to you, then you're automatically disqualified. I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll figure out who's who and, and make sure that uh, the winner, the top three folks get their gift cards. So I'll give folks another minute or two. Like I said, don't be intimidated by this. Go ahead and jump in. You'll be amazed at how many times you can take a guess and get the right answer. And, uh, you know, hopefully you'll walk away with an Amazon gift card tonight. So menti.com 77008191. Give another 20 seconds or so for folks who want to join in at the last minute here. While we're waiting, you know, if you win that $50 gift card, you know, you might be able to buy um, some equipment that you need for the Texas Star Party. So oh, I just <laughs> want to mention... Uh, I did get a response back from Stephen Jones, and he did confirm that was a, a 
a flub on his part. The Novice Lab is going to be Saturday, uh, December 17th. So it's not the Wednesday the 14th that we have on the calendar. Uh, it is Saturday the 17th, and he's told me that he has gone ahead and corrected that on the website. So that should reflect the correct date there. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. First question, looks like it's gonna be uh, related to astronomy news and the James Webb Space Telescope. All right, everybody is in, here we go. On January 24th, 2022, the James Webb Space Telescope reached its very cool final orbit around the sun, the sun and the earth, the earth or the earth and moon. Go ahead and get those answers in. James Webb orbiting the sun, the sun and the earth, the earth or the earth and moon. We're down to three seconds. Get those answers locked in. Time is up. And the correct answer is the sun and the earth. <laughs> I, I know some people are gonna be groaning about this one, but hey, uh, that, that one is uh, more people got the correct answer there than some of the other ones. So because the James Webb Space Telescope is orbiting at the Lagrange Lagrangian L2 point of the Earth-Sun orbit, uh, it is technically orbiting both the Earth and the Sun. So that is the correct answer there. So uh, I know I probably would have missed that myself. Uh, we see Millie with the slide edge. Clippy is at 887, E2, ET in third place. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to figure out who's who at the end here. All right, second question. On November 18th, 1833, this event caused panic and was likely the first crowdsourced science project. Was it the closest approach of Halley's Comet to Earth? Rumor that arsenic was the in the tail and caused widespread public panic. B, a major meteor storm convinced many that the stars were falling from the sky, a mark of the end times. Or C, a massive supernova was so bright that many people thought it was the coming of an army of angels to end the world. Which one is it? All right, here we go. That one took a little bit longer to kind of load. So was it Halley's Comet, a meteor storm, or a massive supernova? We've got about 10 seconds left. Get those answers in. Time is up. And it was indeed a meteor storm. So uh, I can't believe, I, I, I don't remember if it was the, the Perseids or the Leonids at the time, but it's one of those, if you've read about it, uh, it makes you wish there were time machines that you could go back and observe these things. <laughs> I think at the time they said there were 500,000 per hour at peak, uh, 500,000 meteors, just absolutely amazing. So a meteor storm was the correct answer. All right, question three, using info from, he received from the uh, public, this is an Olmsted named the Leonid Mini Shower and claimed it was due to tiny bits of Comet Templeton. So there you go, it was the Leonid Mini Shower. All right, who's in the lead now? I think we might have had a little. Debbie's in now. And Debbie's in the lead right ahead of Bill Conkle and then Don in third place. There we go. Ryan C was the, the fastest to answer that one. All right, after Edmund Halley, was, uh, I was the third astronomer royal uh, to measure stellar parallax. I hung a zenith telescope from a chimney to measure a star's position. Was that A. James Bradley, Charles Messier, John Flamsteed, or Christian Huygens? I would never get this question. I'd have to guess at this one. <laughs> Three seconds left. Get those answers in. Time is up. The correct answer was James Bradley. Only three people got that one. Like I said, these things can change. So don't give up, don't get disparaged if you're not getting these correct now. There's a good chance you'll be in it at the end. So Bradley knew the change in position of stars three months out of phase, not parallax. Bradley discovered stellar aberration. Send your complaints to Don Selly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Purdue, Michelle, and Bran the Broken got that correct. And uh, we still see Debbie in the lead with Bill right behind her and Don. So uh, the top three haven't changed. In some early star atlases, Buates, the herdsman, is depicted chasing off the bears Ursa Major and Ursa Minor with what nearby constellation? Is it A, Pegasus, the winged horse, B, Berenice's hair, comma, Berenice's, 
C, the hunting dogs, Canis Venetici, or D, Sagita, the bow and arrow. And that's going to load here. Think about that question and get ready to answer. I think by preloading it like that, Don gives you a little bit of extra time to think about it and hopefully get those extra points at the beginning. So is it Pegasus, Coma, Berenaces, uh, Canis Venetici, or Sagita? Or Sagita, I've heard it several ways, yes. Five seconds left, get those answers in. Time is up. Canis Venetici, that is correct. Most of the seven of you got that. Uh, the other seven didn't. So those are the hunting dogs, Canis Venetici. So congratulations on those who got those answers. Brian Kudnick looks like you are the fastest there. Yeah, you were. And now Brian moves into third place, Bill Conkle is our new leader, the Pradeep in second place. All right, for an elliptical orbit, the term apsis describes A, the general term for an elliptical orbit, for the farthest or nearest points between the orbiting body and its primary, B, the farthest or nearest points a third body comes to a minor body, or C, either of the two points where an orbit intersects a plane of reference, i.e. rotational plane to which it's inclined. And here we go. Push your phone or your device now. You, you should start seeing those answers and get them in. Is it the closest or nearest points of the two bodies, farther, farthest or nearest points of the third body, or the two points intersecting a reference plane? Again, I have no clue. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure Don is laughing somewhere. He's at his grandson's 12th birthday party tonight, so he couldn't be here for this. It is uh, answer A, closest or nearest points of the two bodies. So there you go. I think the, the bulk of the folks answered C, which is what I would have done too, right? <laughs> Let's just split the difference. Uh, the apsides, uh, apsides, apsides refer to the farthest apo and the nearest peri points reached by an orbiting planetary body with respect to a primary or host body. So there you go. All right, next question. In 2020, 20, uh, 2022, astronomers paid homage to the Lord of the Rings by naming which new discovery? Is it A, smog for a very active T Tauri star, which looks to be belching fire in infrared images? B, Durin during, uh, for the discovery of the 60th dwarf galaxy, which is part of the Milky Way subgroup? Or E, Irondel for the discovery by Hubble Space Telescope of the earliest and most distant star now known? So smog, Durin, or Irondel? All right, this is question six, so we're in the second half here. We're getting close to... Uh, the finale, and everybody has a chance, so it looks like everybody's still in it. A, B, or C. Ten seconds left. This, this 20 seconds here seems to be taking a while. <laughs> All right, one second left. Get those questions and those answers in. Uh, and, okay, seven people got that Irondale there. Very good. I did not know that one myself. Uh, Irondel GR is at a co-moving distance of 28 billion light years, named for an elven character known as the Morning Star. There you go. Again, we all learn something every day here. Um, all right, next question. My data on a galaxy rotation started the study of dark matter. An observatory is named after me, but I was not awarded the Nobel Prize. Who am I? Am I Margaret Burbridge? Am I Jocelyn Del Burnell? Or am I Vera Rubin? Margaret Burbridge, Jocelyn Del Burnell, or Vera Rubin? This is question seven out of 10. Again, you've got a little bit of time to get those bonus points now that Don is letting you uh, take a look at what the questions are ahead of time. I changed the direction of cosmology. Who am I? I get those answers in. Dun, 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 dun. And if you were in on some of our earlier discussions, our, our meetings this year, you should know this. So. <laughs> All right, time is up. And the answer is indeed Vera Rubin. We actually had somebody here to talk about the Vera Rubin Observatory earlier this year. So I think uh, Don wanted to make sure you all were paying attention when he's setting up the program. So eight people did get that. Ruben spent her life advocating for women in science, 
and was known for her mentorship of aspiring female astronomers. And uh, I'm glad she's finally getting the recognition for everything that she's done, albeit uh, decades too late <laughs> in many cases. All right, what is a faculon? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Is it a bright spot on a star's photosphere formed by concentrations of magnetic field lines? Is it B, a large distribution of match which creates a gravitational lens? Is it C, an optical effect seen in stars, including the sun, where the center part of the disk appears brighter than the edge? Or is it D, a blood-sucking undead creature? <laughs> Count Bacula, I guess. Huh? I think I know this one. So we'll go ahead and, and uh, move to question eight here. So there are four potential answers for question eight. And we're getting close to the end. So make sure you get these in and, and you uh, have a, an opportunity to win some of these gift cards. Is it a bright spot on a star? Mass causing gravitational lens, the bright center of a star, or is it a vampire? Five seconds left, folks. Get those answers in. All right. The answer is bright spot on a star. Very good. Most of you got that. Wonderful. Specular are bright spots on a star. There you see the groups of speculators there. All right. Who do we have in the lead now? We haven't shown you the leaderboard. Uh, we wanted people to uh, continue to figure out where they were. Bill is still in the lead, followed closely by Pradeep, and Mark T now is in third place, but hot on his heels is Nichelle there. All right. Question nine, astronomy, like all sciences, is full of acronyms. Which of the following acronyms was used to describe an astronomical discovery in 2022? Is it A, GOAT? A newly discovered planetary nebula in Capricorn, which looks like the head of a ram? Is it B, Boat? A gamma ray burst in the constellation Sagittarius, which is the most energetic ever, de ever detected? Or is it WOW, a strange radio signal received from the direction of the con constellation Sagittarius? Could it be ET phoning home? So GOAT, BOAT, or WOW? Go ahead and get those answers in once it comes up on your smartphone or your laptop screen, your computer screen. And you've got 20 seconds to get that locked in. Goat, boat, or wow. Remember, it says which new discovery was made in 2022. Three seconds left. Right, time is up. The correct answer is indeed boat. Uh, for those of you who answered wow, that the wow signal was uh, decades back. Uh, so this did ask which discovery was made in 2022. So it is both. A GRB 221009A discovered uh, 122922 was unusually nearby Earth and very bright GRB dubbed boat by its discoverers. Not sure if that date is the right date because we haven't gotten to 1229 yet. So, uh, but that is indeed the discovery for this year. So, all right, who is in the lead right now? Bill still showing up strong. Other people answered faster, but I think Bill's able to hold on to his lead. All right, looks like it's gonna come down to Bill Pradeep and then we've got a, a, a glut there for third place. So it all comes down to this last question. Be ready to go here. Approximately how long are the uh, seasons on the planet Neptune? Approximately how long are the seasons on the planet Neptune? Are they A, 22 Earth years, B, 82 Earth years, or C, 41 Earth years? Last question. Make sure you get this right. You've got a shot for those Amazon gift cards. <laughs> All right, Neptune seasons are about how long? A, 22 Earth years, B, 82 Earth years, or C, 41 Earth years? Renee, I see you trying to do the calculations in your yeah. head. <laughs> All right, one second, and time is up. And, oh, oh, okay, 10 of you got the correct answer. 41 Earth years, that is indeed correct. Um, all right, let's see who won. Good job, Don, giving us a Snoop Dogg uh, gift there. And the winner is, I should, I should say the winners. <laughs> it is not wanting me to do this. All right, there we go. Man, look at that. Wow. I'm telling you, everybody has a shot here. All right, Bill Conkle is the winner. Let me take note of this. And uh, Bill, congratulations on 
winning the uh, 2022 trivia contest. I know this is not an easy one. This was the first time I had a chance to look at the questions and uh, I, I'm glad I didn't participate because I would have been at the bottom of the list there. Pradeep, congratulations on winning second. And Brian Kudnick, I believe, is that Brian Kudnick? Yep. Brian, you want to come That's off me. of mute? Okay. Congratulations. Uh, I will reach out to each one of you individually and we'll get your address or your email address so we can send you a digital copy of that uh, that Amazon gift card. So congratulations, everybody. Thank you very much for playing. And uh, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, if you didn't, they were not my questions. So <laughs> <laughs> you can complain to, to, to Don, but uh, no, I, I really do appreciate Don taking the time and effort to, to put those questions together. He does do a lot of research to make sure that these are, are tough trivia questions. So uh, thank you. All right, and we'll wrap it up with an ask me anything. So uh, this is an opportunity to ask uh, questions of myself. We have other leaders of the club here like Renee, Bram Weissman, Steve Goldberg and, and others. So if you have questions about the club, you're just not unsure how things kind of operate or you just want clarification on anything, we'll just go ahead and ask people to uh, come off of mute and ask those questions of us. So um, if you've got a question, please feel free to ask that now. And I want at least one question. I don't want to have to, to go to bed tonight thinking, man, I didn't get a single question. So, no, Bram, you've usually got a, a pretty good set of questions to ask. Yeah, um, this is Sol. How about uh, 2023 plans for um, observatory training out there um, for the resources at the dark site? And is, do you typically do it on certain months or not just – Appreciate anything anyone can share for trying to plan the calendar for the year. Yeah, no, I appreciate the question, Saul. And, and we're lucky we have Renee on with us tonight, who is um, kind of our lead trainer out there at the dark site. I'm not misrepresenting you. Well, but. you know, every time we've been trying to do that, something has happened at the uh, observatory. At the moment, uh, we don't have a uh, computer to run uh, the um Oh, Brian, you probably know the most about that. You're using the handbox to uh, run the um, C14, I think. Um, but I haven't gotten out there to see about fixing it or replacing it. Um, so nothing is on the schedule yet um, and won't be until I can get out there, confer with Chris and train some new trainers. I know Doug is wanting to get trained. Um, and if any of you would like to get trained, okay, great, Joe. Um, that would really be helpful. I um, uh, talked to Steve the other way, actually I talked to him via email. He said that everything is fixed on the C14, but I'm not gonna be out there until the 16th of December. So when I go out there, I can confirm that. Oh, that would be wonderful. Do let us know, Brian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris told me that they did fix the C14. So. Oh, the piece, the, the connection between the PC and the, okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, for those of you who've been to the observatory, uh, the next time you go there, you'll probably not recognize it. We've got quite a bit of new equipment out there. I think C14 is the uh, only thing that we have remaining from our 2021 inventory. Uh, we were lucky to receive a donation of a uh, six-inch Takahashi TOA-150, and we have a, um, no, no, I think the 16-inch the RCOS was put in last year as well, wasn't it, Renee? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I was I was texting to somebody. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I just said yes. Two of the three telescopes we have in the observatory. Oh, uh, yeah. My uh, favorites. I'm going to have to get a new picture taken because... Uh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Pradeep did have a question as well. Pradeep, I don't know if you want to come off of mute and ask, and if not, I, I can ask the question to Renee. I don't hear him coming off, but here was his question. He said, uh, Renee, a uh, question for Renee, what scripting language does she use to write code in Stellarium? Oh, okay. Um, it is its own scripting, but, um, and who's asking me? That was Pradeep. Um, do you want to um, email me and then I can show you what's done? Yeah, if he wants to email you, that's uh, and I'll put your uh, Renee, would you uh, actually I'll do it here. Okay, okay thank you. 
Renee G. Yeah, that, that's the best one. For Autonomy Houston. Uh, org. I'm putting that in the uh, chat there, but uh, you can reach out directly to Renee using that email address. And if, if for oh, whatever, Pradeep, I hope you're planning to do something fun. I'd like I, I'd like you to share that with us. Absolutely. All right. Any other questions that we have before we wrap up tonight? Uh, any guesses on the weather for the next? The gathering we're going to have out at the, the dark site. <laughs> well, we're not planning anything until it is good weather. That's right. <laughs> Clear skies. That's it. That's it indeed. Well, we do, like I said, folks, have uh, the novice lab that's scheduled for the 17th of December. We have a few other events that are um, scheduled on the calendar, the, the, the SIG meetings and whatnot. Uh, if you have ideas for anything that you'd like to do with the club, you can always send me an email, joek at astronomyhouston.org, and uh, heck, we'll give it a shot. There's there's no reason why we can't uh, give some of these things a try. Uh, the other thing I was going to ask everybody to do, if you don't mind, um, a few months back, we had a social event out at a brewery kind of centrally located here in Houston. If there's a place that you think would be a, a good place to have a, a an event for the club, let's say you know anywhere from 30 to 40 people, send me an, an email with that information, and I'll contact those places and see if we can get uh, some of these social events set up uh, for folks. We wanna make sure that we're going to different parts of town, not just kind of staying centrally located. So if there's anything on the west side of town, north side of town, south side, east side, whatever it may be, let us know and, and we'll go ahead and get that done. Same thing I wanted to mention around urban, urban observing. Uh, I know we've had a couple of events out at Memorial Park, uh, which is centrally located. It is walking distance from my house. It's, it's convenient. But uh, if there's a location that you think, hey, this might be a great place, uh, shielded from some of the uh, exterior lights. I know we can't do anything about the light dome, but if we don't have you know bright lights, uh, you know, pointed directly at us, those might be places where we could do urban observing events as well. So if you've got some ideas there, uh, let let us know. I know a few years back there were several people that mentioned a park down near Pearland. So, um, you know, if there's anything like that out there, or out in the woodlands, whatever it may be, let us know and, and we'll just keep an eye out for those. Uh, we'll, we'll try to make arrangements with the authorities there to get use of the facilities. And if the weather is clear, then we might uh, have one of these pop up urban observing events. So uh, stay tuned for that. All right. Uh, any last questions before we wrap up? All right. Well, folks, uh, again, thank you very much for uh, what in all terms for me is a very successful 2022 year here at the East Astronomical Society. It looks like we're finally turning a corner on the quarantining. Uh, you know, COVID is still with us, but we're learning to live with it more. And we're hoping that uh, as we learn to live with it and as it continues to hopefully attenuate and not be as serious as it may have been, uh, that we're able to do more outreach events more events out at the dark site and so on and so forth. So uh, look forward to uh, another great year in 2023 with lots of events. If you have ideas, like I said, send, the, send us emails. We're more than happy to see what we can do to accommodate those. And our next meetings are gonna be uh, in January. So our novice meeting is going to be January 5th. That will be uh, headed by Chris Morrison, our new novice chairperson. Uh, that is gonna be online uh, at 7 p.m. through Zoom. And our general meeting is going to be the following Friday, January 6th, online as well. If you are curious about what we're doing, what we have going on, what are what events we have, you can go to the website. Even though we're doing the migration, you still should be able to see the content. We're just not processing any of the membership uh, renewals or whatnot now, but we will reach out to everybody to let them know when it's good to do that. Uh, and then lastly, if you're on any of the social media platforms, uh, please give us a follow. You can see the different platforms there. And if you have any questions, uh, you can email us, info at astronomyhouston.org. You can email me, joek at astronomyhouston.org. And with that, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, a, a Happy Hanukkah, a Happy Kwanzaa, a Happy Holidays. Whatever you celebrate, I want everybody to be uh, happy, joyous, and, and hope that uh, this coming season brings you everything that you hope for. So uh, have a good night, everybody, and we'll talk to you too. And Saul said Festivus, yes. Uh, Festivus for the rest. Festivus, yeah. <laughs> Take care, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>